Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we have the one, the only, Prince Wilson. Prince, how you doing? I'm doing phenomenal. It is a wonderful day. It's bright outside today in New York City, and so I'm just, I'm just living it up. I, yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm so excited to have you on the show. Um, we've we've known each other through the Party Corgi Discord and various other channels for a while, and you are like just a walking embodiment of a ray of sunshine. Like you you are anthropomorphized joy, and I uh, I I'm so happy to have you on the show. So for for those of us who are not familiar with your work, um, do you want to give us a little bit of a background on yourself? Yeah. Um. So. How do I describe myself in like the shortest amount of ways? Uh, I'm a software engineer that works at a company called Newzella, which is an ed tech company based in New York, where we focus around creating educational content for students. And specifically that content is focused around like news, which mm. is like one of those things you're like, why would I want to teach kids about the news? It's like, but that's such an important skill to be able to like read the news and like know different things that are happening in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we even do things like about Fortnite and whatnot, which is, you might be surprised, that's news. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. So, um, yeah, so uh, outside, what about, what about outside of work? Like you are, you are so much more than a job, Prince Wilson. That's a good point. Um, outside of work is primarily still doing coding things, but I also read a lot of comics and play a lot of video games. My current video game of choice right now is Ghost of Tsushima, which is a PS4 game. Is that the one? Um, so I, I was, I think I was watching you play this. Is that the one where you were fighting like the ghost monkeys? No, that's Sekiro, um, and that is also a samurai game, but <laughs> very close. Like I'm really, I have like a theme samurai. I actually really enjoy those types of games. Nice, nice. Yeah. So, um, so today we are going to be doing code things. Um, I, I think. You know, we it, we also have, if you're interested in such things, a uh, a party quirky game night chat uh, that happened last night where we played Prince was there uh, Among Us, which is a like space. I, what do, what would you even say that game is like? What's the point of that game? To lie to your friends? <laughs> <laughs> it's like Clue, but in space, and people die more frequently. Yeah, it's it's pretty rough. Um, and also I'm very bad at it. Uh, yeah, ben <laughs> Benjamin is in the chat. I am the imposter. It was obvious from the start. <laughs> okay. Um, but so what we, what we want to do today, not about gaming is we wanted to do a little bit of rust. And so this is going to be really fun because I have written zero lines of rust in my entire career. Um, I've also <laughs> written maybe under a hundred lines of typed language code in my entire career. Like I'm not a, I've never been a, a Java dev or, or gotten into any of those things that, that like when I look at rust, it kind of feels reminiscent of that sort of thing. And I'm hoping that you're going to be able to talk a little bit about that, that origin. Um, so what I would love to hear from you is what got you into rust? Well, there was a tweet where it's basically like, I want to learn another language. And at first I was like, you know, I'm going to pick up Python because I use that at work. Hmm. Um, but then I was like, you know, I kind of want to decouple what I'm doing outside of work with just things that interest me. And one thing that's just been really interesting me right now has just been about a lot of system level programming. So that's kind of what led me to Rust is like, I didn't want to write C code because that was my first language. And I was like, I had terrible experiences with writing C and I don't want to do that again. Uh, not to shame anyone who's writing C, you are all amazing folks. I just cannot write C. And so Russ came through and I was like, wow, this is a lot of fun to write. Yeah, awesome. Um, and so uh, there was a question in the chat. Vintu, you asked about the VOD. It's gonna be on the Party Corgi Network Twitch. Uh, you should follow that one because we do those game nights semi-regularly and they are very silly. Um, so with, with Rust, like, so Rust has, a lot of, there are a lot, I mean, it's got a big following, right? And um, I'm noticing a, a ton of people are really getting excited about it. What would you say, like, if, if you're gonna, you're choosing Rust, um, Rust is a, a backend language, a frontend language? What did, how, what would you use it for? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that like, for the most part, 
you're going to see it in a, a several different places. I guess you could kind of say it's a backend language. Um, the idea is that it can like describe to how to manage like requests. There's a lot of tooling mm. around making web frameworks as well inside of okay. Rust. But these the tool is applicable for things like command line interfaces. There's also a huge wave within WebAssembly and like how that works with Rust. And I think that's where we see a lot of overall kind of progress with Rust being a kind of the the staple to how can we make JavaScript even more powerful than it currently is. And then you'll also see it in embedded systems and system level programming. So it's kind of yeah. like multi-purpose. You can go all over the place, right? And then I, I think I saw um, like Chris Biscardi, who's also in the, the Party Corgi Discord, he's doing a, a Rust, it's not even really a prototype anymore. It's now just a thing he's building of uh, of doing a static site generator powered by Rust. And, and that is being distributed as like, does that, is it building to Wasm? Do you, is that a thing that people are doing with Rust? That is a thing that people are doing with Rust. That particular tool isn't what he's doing. Okay. Uh, but I think that a lot of the things that he's doing is like learning how we can take some of the kind of the benefits of Rust, like some of the strictness that it has to describe some of the things that he wants to be doing for his static site generator, which I think mm. that's like where we can see kind of benefits in that way. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Okay, so um, I guess maybe the 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 best thing to do then is just to get right to it, right? So let's uh, let's switch over into pairing mode and let's see if we can write some code. Um, before we get started, let's do a quick shout out to the sponsors. We are getting live captioning right now as we speak by White Coat Captioning. Thank you so much to Amanda who's with us today. Um, you can go to lwj.dev slash live to see those captions. Um, those are made possible by Netlify, Fauna, Sanity, and Auth0, who all generously chip in to make the captioning affordable for us and make the show more accessible to more people. Um, so yeah, super, super excited about that. I just saw a sub come in from Kaylee. Thank you so much. I also saw before we started uh, that Ben upped his subscription. So thank you both so much for, for the sub. Um, I guess Twitch is doing something right now called September, which I guess means that you can get a discount. So if you've been thinking, hey, you know, I really wish I could use the boop emoji and bury Jason in print, hint, 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 um, then you could do that right <laughs> now and you could get it at a at a ripping discount, I think. So <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking of, of uh, shameless self-promotion, you should also go and follow Prince on Twitter. He is delightful. Um, that being said, let's talk about Rust a little bit more. Here is the, the Rust homepage. And here we go with the boops. It's coming. Um, <laughs> we haven't even started. Thank you, Pilo, for the sub. Very much appreciated. Uh, so, okay, so Rust, it is a language empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software. I like that promise. Um, if I want to get started, you know, I should have asked this before we were live. Do I need to install a bunch of stuff to make this work? So there's a yes and no answer to that question. We can, <laughs> we can install things. It won't take long. We can okay. also use, the, similar to Code Sandbox, there is a Rust playground as well. Uh, so we can do either one of those. I think installing is totally fine. There's some kind of nifty tricks we can do along the way. Yeah, yeah, um, let's let's install it for sure. Um, and Eco, thank you for the sub. A full year, holy crap, one year of subs. It still doesn't even feel like I've been doing this show for a year. What's up, Will? Let's go. Um, let's go. J Jimmy Millard is in the chat making all sorts of rusty jokes right now. Um, <laughs> no no tetanus here, Jimmy. We are We are just writing code. Um, all right, so we've also done a fun thing where we're going to do collaborative code. So if I want to get started, what should I do to get Rust running on my computer? So if we go back to the Rustling page, there's a big yellow button, I believe, that says getting started. Oh, yeah, that top. one. Got it. So we can click that button and it's basically like, cool, you can get started without doing the thing or you can do this uh, command line script. Always love, you know, copying and pasting random scripts into the system. Yeah, this yeah, thing. whatever, copy paste, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, thank you, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna get your name wrong, so I'm just gonna say thank you. Appreciate so, the sub very much. 
when we install this, what it's going to do is going to install adult supervision what is known as here. Rust Up. <laughs> <laughs> and Rust I, Up is like the MVM or like Rust manager. It does a lot of other things as well. So we can have like different versions of Rust as well. But nice. we'll just go with the default. Uh, in default. One. Here we go. Cargo clip. Oh my God. Did you just install Clippy on my computer? I did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, you know what I found gonna... yesterday that I'm going to show you? What it's what was it? It was like make... <laughs> I already love this word art. Like it's already starting off great. <laughs> make word art. Yeah. Look at this. So this is a website that I found. <laughs> and you can make your own word art and it is just delightful. And I would highly recommend that everybody goes and plays with it. Uh, <laughs> Can you save it? Like, can can you like export your word art? <laughs> I think so. I right, let's find out. No, maybe I don't know. That's so cute. Oh wait, yeah, I can do something. Share, Share on it, Facebook. I would never it. see Look at this, this little thing. <gasps> oh beautiful. It is beautiful. Um. Yeah. All right. Uh. Yeah. So this is great. Yes. We. Um. It, Alex, you're, you're late. You're too late. We we're done. This is it. This is this is this what is we did today is word art. Um, we're done, everybody. Pack it up. We're going home. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I have installed Rust. And now that I have installed Rust, I should I should probably actually run this right so that we've got Rust in the, the thingy. Yes, let's do that. Okay. Excellent. Way to test is always, uh, you know, Rust C, and we can do uh, space hyphen hyphen version. Like that. Yep. Exactly. We got it. We have we have Amazing. a Rust. So for context, this is the compiler. So okay. like one of the major differences between like something like JavaScript and something like this is that it's a compiled version. Uh, so we'll do like a step where we take our source code and we create an executable that we have to run. So we can like start with a very basic file and then like work our way up to what you would see like in a traditional like Rust project. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So um, do you want me to start in this this live share here or should yeah. we start in the command line? Okay. Well, let's go in here. So let's start. Uh, let's make a new file. Let's just call like main.rs. That dot rs signifies the like the file system that we're writing some Rust, and you'll see in like VS Code, it's already like ready to go. It already knows that it's a Rust file. Look at that! I even had Rust hi syntax highlighting installed. Like that's, I did not know I had done that. Maybe that I don't know pre -built. if that was already pre-built for <laughs> VS Code or where it came from. We can. There's also some other extensions that exist that I can share later. Um, that might be helpful and nice. Nice. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, so all right, I've got my main.rs and I guess this is my first time writing Rust, so I, I guess we have to do the obligatory hello world, right? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> just to be fancy, we'll make it like hello chat to like to empathize with like what we were doing before with the uh, word art. <laughs> yes, perfect. Okay. Um to start, like do we we don't have like an echo command or anything, do we? Like I can't just be like hello chat. Nope. Uh, every Rust project, everything is going to need a, a main function. Similar to like what you see in C, uh, okay. you're going to need to have like a main function. To write our function, we'll have to use the keyword fn and then the name of our function. So main, and then we'll put parenthesis afterwards, and then we'll use our curly braces. Similar to what you see in like other languages okay. when you're writing your functions, but we'll use the fn keyword. And then what we'll do is we'll say print ln and then an exclamation mark, and then parenthesis, and then we give it a string of whatever we want to paste out. Okay. So and far, it feels like pretty ergonomic, right? That's not bad. So is the is this to say like I want to run this function? So it's a special type of function. Uh, so not every function is going to look like this, but this one in particular, print, will do this. We'll need to do it this way. Okay. And then before we're finished, we just have to add a semicolon after the print line. Um, 
that is the only caveat with doing some Rust code is that we're going to need to do a bunch of semicolons. So you better be ready for it. I'm ready for it. I love semicolons. Usually I just let Prettier <laughs> do it for me, but I guess in, in Rust we'll have to do it ourselves, I guess. Um, there is okay. a Rust format, and I think it does it for us. I am speaking out of, I don't know, <laughs> really true. Uh, but there is a prettier equivalent that's built into Rust, which is kind of cool. Oh, that's super cool. Okay. So if I run, um, let me make sure that I have it here, Rusty version. Perfect. I have Always it. a great check. Okay. And then can I, do I execute this or do I compile it first? So yeah, so this is always going to do our uh, compile compiling step first. So we'll okay. say like Rust C and then we'll give it the file that we want to compile. Ooh. And wow, then, it did all that stuff and then it did and then it did no stuff. Right. It does a bunch of stuff for us and then it like takes them all away. And so this you won't be able to read it inside of VS Code. Okay. Um, but you can try to open it anyway and see what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's see what's in here. Ooh. So is, is this like straight machine code? Or like... uh, I don't know. Yeah, like it, it's a binary file, so it nice. will do some executables for us. So now we have this executable. So we run it like every script that we do inside of our terminal. So we use like the period slash and then the name of our file, which is just main. We did it. Congratulations. You're now I'm putting a rust, rust on my rest. Wait, does that mean that I can I can do the yee claw? Yes, you can do the yee claw. Yee <laughs> oh all right uh somebody clip that because we are going to make that into a command for the channel for the like the one other time in the future that i'll ever say <laughs> <laughs> i was not ready for it <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> just take a break, everybody. I was not ready for it. <laughs> that was yeah, Alex not, and Chad I, is saying that was like scripted for somebody else, but it was not scripted for me. I had no idea. Here's the thing. I like I've been I've been just watching everybody having a great time with the all the Rust jokes and I've been feeling very left out. So now that I've written at least some rust code i feel like i can be included and so I, that was a lot of pent up like rust envy it just came out in that yee claw that was amazing that was so good <laughs> all right i'm let's... still like really <laughs> <laughs> okay so i'm ready to roll like let's let's do some more so so at at its surface like this immediately feels Familiar, you know, as as someone who has written various programming languages, you know, we're we're doing all the same things. We're declaring functions, we're naming our functions, we have the ability, it looks like, to pass in arguments, and we've got whatever the equivalent of the print or echo or or you know, whatever command. Um I'm gonna have to look up exactly how that works because I I get it, but I don't get it, you know what I mean? Um, this one is a special function uh, oh, for context. Okay, got it. It's called got it. a macro. Um, and oh. so like, that's the reason why it doesn't feel very similar is because it does specific things gotcha. for you. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like, I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to do more stuff. So what should we do next? Thank you very much. Unmarked vans, unmarked vans. That's a, <laughs> that's a spooky, spooky Twitter or spooky Twitch username. Uh, but thank you nonetheless for the, the sub. Enjoy those boops. Please spam them at will. Um, at some point, I fully expect y'all to drown Prince in boops before the stream ends. <laughs> Preferably after we get through coding things so that people can still see the screen. <laughs> um, okay, so where where would you like to go from here? So let's... Let's start by making a new project. So like I mentioned before, we installed Rust mm -hmm. and we use what the script that we ran installed the program called Rust Up, which is just like a Rust version manager. Okay. In addition to that, it, it installed a bunch of other stuff. Uh, one of those things is Cargo, which is the package library kind of built in to Rust. Okay. So in our terminal, what we'll do is we'll say like Cargo, perfect. And we'll say like cargo new, and then we'll name our project. So this is the the equivalent of like starting a new NPM project. You can kind of think about it. Like oh, nice. 
If I target this folder, will it break because the folder is not empty? Let's find out. Nope. Okay. Oh, wait, I can cargo init this directory. I don't know what that will do. Let's find so out. Let's find oh, out. Oh, God. What did it do? Is this what we wanted? Um, yes, yes. I don't see your uh, file tree. So I was like, oh, where, where's all the other files? But yes, this is exactly oh, you don't... what we want. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is, this is very cool. So we've got, uh, it already found the, the main.rs, which is awesome. Um, it picked up a name. It, ah, oh, this is, yeah, this is very cool. And so actually, does that mean that now it's going to change the, the name that we execute to what is Rust? I think it does. We could start over. Ooh, no, I want to see. Does it do it? I, so it's not going it, to, it, it might not work right now, but one thing we can do is, okay. so Cargo does the like build run uh, test kind of project for us, similar to like what you would do inside of NPM. It doesn't have like customizable scripts like you would want, um, but let's say we try to do Cargo run. Let's try that instead. Cargo run. Mm -hmm. Compiling. So Yep, so it does the compilation step for us, and then it will tell us where it's going to... Wow, and it ran. It did it. I did not know that was going to work, and so I love it. Love when it just does the thing. Super exciting. This, this is very, very cool stuff. Um, and so it, it did build it out as what is Rust. Uh, also, does that... Do you get a song? Because I, am, am I, I think I'm like a lot older than you, so I think my the song... I'm like, what is Rust? Baby, no, don't hurt I, No, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> No just more. do the rest of the episode like this. I don't know if it's... The, oh, yes! <laughs> I was, wasn't sure if I was in the opposite direction. <laughs> and so I made sure to do it that way first. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Excellent. Um, stainless steel? What are you talking about, Yash? I don't even know what that means. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do... We've, so we've built a project. And this... As you said, looks very like you know it's obviously written in Tamil, which is Tamil, um, <laughs> but it's familiar. Like it looks like what I would expect in a, a package JSON or or any other kind of declaration file. We've got names, versions, who wrote it. Um, I assume is that the name of the the Rust edition, or I don't know what edition means. Yeah, so that's like the ver yeah, exactly. You can think of it like that. It's like what edition of Rust did it come through with? Got it. And then this looks like the output. So this is the input file. This is the output file, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then it also looks like we could, if we wanted, install dependencies. Yes. Very and so cool. similarly, like to npm, you would just be like, I want these dependencies. We do have to explicitly mark them ourselves. Uh, so that's the only kind of like. Oh, you can't just like run npm install and like it just works. Okay. And so do we want to do that or what what do you want to do first? Let's hold off for writing any dependencies first just because we have to like explore more of what is there. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. So, um Let's see, there's a comment in the chat. Usually the sources are in source, so the bin is only necessary because here that's not the case. Yes. Fair. Um, yeah. So if I, does that mean that if I make a source folder and I move this in here and I was like, get out of here, and then I was like, cargo run, it does work. Look at you taking what? all your knowledge and putting it together like that. Like, that's awesome. Like, I didn't know, one, that I could change, like, the bin and whatnot. So we both just learned something together. This is very cool stuff. I'm I'm pumped about this. Like, this, I, I realize that I am so, so in the shallow end of this pool, but I'm like, let's try everything in Rust. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's do something, uh, let's do something else. Let's dig into whatever, whatever you want to do next, but uh, let's, let's write some Rust. All right, let's start with just some types. Um, okay. So that's probably the the thing that we can like elevate towards. Like, let's like make a variable. So okay. a keyword for making a variable inside of Rust uh, would be like let, and everything has to exist inside of a function. So let's oh. put uh, that inside of our main function. OK. 
Got it, got it, got it. Uh, and let's make it like age. And this is my age and we'll give it, we'll say equal to, I don't know, I'm giving you a random age. This is not my actual age, uh, 10. Let's say that. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we'll do our semicolon. Perfect. Now, if we do this um, and save it, and then we try to do cargo run, let's see what happens. Ooh, it doesn't like it. It doesn't like it. Why do you say it doesn't like that? Let's see. It says we didn't use the variable. Right. So this is like just a warning. Oh, um, cool. But that's like kind of goes into Rust is already kind of intelligent it's kind of baked in with like telling you oh hey there are some like things you can do to improve our code um so we'll have our variable and then let's like print out that variable so like my age is this thing and so we'll start with the uh, printlin perfect and we'll say my age and you're probably like oh how do i like do interpolation and the answer is similar so, I don't know if you've ever used Python. It's, it's kind of feels similar to Python, uh, where we have like curly brackets inside of our string, and then we'll have a comma afterwards. Like that? Uh, we need to close it, and then a comma outside of the string. I've never seen this before. Okay. So we'll take, I'll take that out and move it here, and we'll do H. Like oh, that. I understand. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. So we're we're defining like where it goes. Yeah. And then we're dropping in. And so if we had two, would we do like another one and then like another argument out here? Let's start with doing the first okay. one. And okay, we'll all right, fine. One. Don't let me get ahead of myself, I guess. <laughs> no, I mean, I think <laughs> asking those questions is a good thing. Okay, Perfect. all right, here we go. So let's do, let's do this. Let's do, I'm trying to think of another like silly variable. Like, let's say, um. Let's add a new variable color, and this is going to represent your favorite color. Um, so we'll say like let color equal, and we'll do a string of whatever thing that we want. And we, let's do it above so we can do it in the same printlin to test what your question was. Okay. Um, nice. Right. Right. Okay. And so you can like, yep, perfect. Let's see what happens when I try this. Can I spell chartreuse twice in one episode? Stay tuned to find out. Nope. Uh, so it doesn't <laughs> like this because it is not found in this scope, which means that my my <laughs> completely uneducated guess about how this might function was incorrect. <laughs> Actually, I think that uh, from what it says, it says chartreuse is not found because our variable oh. is called color. But I will, I'm glad that you also <laughs> read the error. So that also was like a good like process. That okay, was but let's, let's take a second to point out that I read the error and got exactly the wrong takeaway from that. <laughs> Okay, so let's try that one more time and see now. Oh, it ju it does just work. Yep. Okay, so I would have totally... All right, yeah, that was just... You, you were 100% on it. I was just really excited about trying to spell chartreuse. Yes, I actually was like impressed that you got it right twice because I was like, I don't know how to spell chartreuse. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's because there's booze named after it. That's got to be what it is. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, uh, chartreuse. It's a uh, it's a great color. It's also a great. It's a yellow green color. It's a great uh, like digestif kind of thing. It's a French French liqueur. I had this trivia question once, which is, what is the color chartreuse? Yeah. And chartreuse. They gave you the colors like red, purple, or yellow green, and I was like, it clearly sounds like a purple, and I was baffled. <laughs> to know it's a yellow green the color is lime incorrect nikki it's very different <laughs> slightly different so what this kind of let, lets us see is that we did variables we also talked about different data types that are available right now inside of rest which i think is also kind of a good mm -hmm. important thing to go through um so you see here we have like integers and then we also have strings now things to note is with Rust, integers come in different um, formats. So okay. it kind of just infers what you need at 
at will. Uh, but specifically here, w the kind of, you might have heard of this in computers is that the you know, values inside of programs take different sizes. So you can actually specify how large this integer needs to be available for, what size it can handle, um, or it will cause what is known as an integer overflow. And we can cause that if we would like to. I would like to. All right, let's do it. So like by default, I actually don't know what the size, the, the type is, but it's gonna it's currently inferring what the type is for our integer on okay. line four. We can specify a type by using like the colon and then whatever type that we want. Okay. Let's say we had an integer. Um, let's say it is, it's an integer of, I don't know, eight. Uh, okay. I eight, which represents like it can go 256 bits. Okay. So this is like the two to the power of eight is how you can do that. And if you want to, yeah, exactly. You can throw up a number. That now I done broke it. All right, let's make this happen. And you'll see it cannot compile. And if we oh, so the, the literal 1000 does not fit into the type I eight, whose range is negative 128 to positive 127. Right. That is and very cool. The, the reason for that is one is because we're using an integer. So that means that we have positive and negative numbers. Mm. So I can use 256 uh, between both ways. Right, and basically right, right. know like, okay, how many, how much numbers do I want to have space for? Uh, if we wanted to do an unsigned version of that, we would replace the I with a U. And this would still say- And then it would be 256 instead mm -hmm. of, okay. So this range is from zero to 255. Got um, it. Whereas the other one is negative 128 to 128. And so by, I mean, by setting this as, as 8-bit, um, there, there's some, some interesting chat stuff going on because it's, uh, it's like how many values you get in binary. So 8-bit is, 8-bit's just this, right? Because it would give us 256? 8-bits are 8. Uh, is it straight up 8-bits? Yes. You can only get to 256 with this. That doesn't seem right. Just one, two, four. Well, maybe that is right. I don't know. I'm bad at binary. Anyways, um, the things that like, I'm like, hey, let's take a moment to learn. <laughs> Actually, I don't know this whole answer. <laughs> if somebody's got a helpful video in the chat, please post it so that we don't leave people super confused. Um, cool, and it's I32. And by default, so thank you for that. I thirty, yeah, okay. So, so we get a thirty-two bit integer by default, uh, which is pretty like pretty big. That's probably fine. That's a standard size. You, okay. You're probably going to want to do that. Um, and that I didn't want to speak out of turn because I my intuition was I thirty-two, uh, but I was like I shouldn't say absolutes because I'm always. But so like so if I take this <laughs> right and I just keep going, let's see how far we can go. Is it going to infer that it needs more? I actually don't know if this is bigger than a 32-bit integer, so let's find out. It definitely is. <laughs> it's very large. <laughs> integer literal is too large. Okay. Um, so it, so I, for that, I would need like whatever. Like, will it let me do something like that? For context, uh, I32 or specifically, you know, 32 bits is like what? <laughs> it's four just like, billion? nah, you can't. He can't use that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely not enough. Fine. Yeah, and U one twenty eight is the maximum right now. For who knows, like that, and that's a very large number. So I don't know what kind of programs oh, are writing that are using U I twenty eight. I'm trying to I'm trying to calculate space distances in inches here. Um, okay, so I get it. Yeah, I this this makes sense. Uh, we've found the limits of reasonability <laughs> for numbers. Uh, we would you have want to... a, con a, a context of like how like it works, right? Is like mm -hmm. two to the eight represents eight places. So we have those eight numbers. Okay. And the two represents like, if you think about it, is the two options that you have, either a zero or a one. So that's like how you can keep track of like mm. that in your, your noggin. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That make that makes sense. And if I had a calculator handy, I would be so set for that. <laughs> In case you were like, you know, give myself a trivia question before the compiler tells me. <laughs> no, it's perfect. It's perfect. Um, okay. So we've got this and it will tell us if what we're trying to do doesn't work. So if we like specify uh, that it's a, an 8-bit integer and we go above that, it'll say we can't. What happens if we just try to do something that 
obviously shouldn't work. Like I want to, you know, multiply my age by this color. Let's try it. Okay. How do I do math in Rust? Uh, the same way you do it in other languages, you can just do okay. like age and then the asterisks and then color. And then, yep. Okay. So, in this case, like we're not taking its value, but it's probably going to be like compiler error. I cannot do that thing. Okay. So this is no implementation for integer multiplied by what I'm assuming is like a casting that would like try to force it to an integer. Is that right? Uh, I think from reading this, yes, it's like trying to do multiplication with a string. Mm. And so that that is the reason why you see like the lowercase str there is this, that string. Got it. And And so what if I did like a decimal of this and I just try to do like because because that's now that's a floating point number not an integer so it doesn't like that either and that would be we don't have an implementation for floats and integers so if I wanted to do that then I would what cast that to float oh, wait so similar to the uh the syntax before it's just like the f and we probably still have to say the size f 32. Let's try that. Let's see what happens. Use a float literal. And so you'll see here the, oh. the error is like, I can't do the thing that you're asking me to do because you're not really a float. Like it's just, just because you have the 10 doesn't mean that that's no, the, the anything, thing. Anything can be a float if it believes in itself is really. Okay. So, so basically if you want to do, if you want to do this, you would need to like force it to be afloat okay all right that makes yeah. sense and that's and kind then... of true with a lot of languages right is like there there's certain boundary boxes that we set because we're like cool this is like describable i can describe to you how to do an integer times an integer or float times a float but some languages aren't like able to do that coercion mm. uh, and that's like usually why you have to think about them being the same type or explaining how they should resolve it yeah this is this is cool i like and it, it is helpful that like it's explaining this as as we go, as opposed to just you know saying like invalid type or something, um, which is which is helpful. So all right, so we're we're still, we're getting a warning now. I also really like these warnings that it's like, hey, you didn't actually use that. Did you need that code? Um, and this is one of my favorite things about Rust is that it is very good at explaining to you like, here I see this thing that you might want to watch out for, or you're doing this like erroneous thing altogether. And we don't want you to do that whatsoever. And so if I, um, can I just do something like this? Does that work? Let's find out. I'm very much, let's find out and let's do the thing and let's see what happens. Fine. And so even, and you'll notice there's like helps, warnings, uh, and then errors. So it's yeah. even, it is even good at telling you, hey, you might want to fix it doing this thing. That's cool though, that it lets you, the, the, and the fact that it told me that is very cool because otherwise, you know, if I had tried to do this in, you know, JavaScript or something and it was just, it's just like uncaught error. And then you have to go yeah. Google the uncaught error. So showing me, hey, that's what you should be using. That is, that's really powerful. That's really nice. Yes. And someone in chat has mentioned as well is that you can do quick click printing if you want using debug or DBG exclamation mark. Um, and that's another one of those kind of nifty tools that you can have. What if I what if I try to make it do stuff that it doesn't want to do, like take two integers? It's probably just going to run, right? Yeah. Magic. It even told you that this is an expression with the thing, and it does like what the evaluation is. That's really nice. Like I think that that is a that is a very handy that debug command is amazing. Yeah. That's like really nifty. And I didn't know that it could do the expressions out. I've used it for like telling me what a value is, which is really nifty when you're like doing a bunch of programming. You're like, I don't know what the thing is that I'm looking at right now. So like, let me know what that thing is. Yeah, th and this is handy because this is like when I when I log in JavaScript or whatever, I always wrap the thing I'm doing in an, uh, logging in an object so that I get the name of the variable and then the value. And the fact that this just does that by default shows you the the name of the variable and the value or in the case that you pass it something raw like an expression it shows you the expression and then the outcome that's really cool like i i really do like that yeah 
There's another th- small thing that you can do inside of your print lines. Mm-hmm. Um, so in between the curly braces, there you can do a colon and exclamation mark. And this is another similar like a- exclamation mark instead of, uh, sorry, question mark. I can't question word mark. today. Okay. And this is a similar effect as well, is that it'll tell you um, what the kind of like value can look like. I do that it doesn't wrong? tell you the expression. No, you did it right. Um, it looks the same way. So if something can be displayed in a certain way for your debugging purposes, you can use this syntax as well, but it will output like it's supposed to. And this comes handy when you're looking at like um, another data type called structs. Okay. Okay. Cool. So should we, what's a, what's a struct? Should we try to do one of those? Yes, let's do that. Okay. Uh, so let's start with, let's start with, uh, a tuple and we'll build up to a struct okay. using all the same things. So we can get rid of everything inside of the main function and then we'll start again with another data type. All right. If I, what if I just like. Perfect. Yeah. That so way we can. Here, you can comment using the double slashes, the single slash uh, and like star is also valid in here. So that's good. Oh, too. nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm cheating by using the VS code shortcut for commenting so that it would tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I am the same way. <laughs> All right. All right. This is, I'm, I'm excited. I love learning new stuff. This is so much fun. All right. So I'm, I'm ready. Let's do a, let's do a a tuple. And okay. And so, Oh, wait, a tuple. Wait, wait, did I do it it wrong? I don't know. I've never said that word out loud before, honestly. (laughs) I know it's both are valid. And then I'm just like, I'm glad that you said it the other way. Uh, here, I'm going to just collapse that down so that we can still see what we're doing, but we don't lose that code for later. Perfect. So let's Tupperware. Make... <laughs> <laughs> the show is just about puns. That's really all we're learning with Jason today. <laughs> I'm very into it. Uh, Chris is here. What's up, Chris? Did you see my yee claw? It was a good one. Um, all right. So <laughs> wait, why? No, go back to being collapsed is what I want you to do. There. All right. I'm I'm ready. Let's let's do a let's do a tuple. Cool. So once again, we're going to do like our variable. Let's make this the, let's make it like an RGB. I, that's kind of the go-to that I have always in my head for okay. uh, tuples or tuples. And then what we'll say is colon and then parenthesis. Like this? Yeah. And we can put a space before the, the parenthesis. Oh, before the parenthesis. Got it. Yes. And then we want to describe all the values inside of this tuple. Uh, so I, I would love to know what your, so, I, uh, I don't even know what that color is actually. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. It's, it's, uh, red and So that's like an orangey, orangey yellow, I guess. Yep. I, yeah. Red, green, hmm, I, orange, yellow. I like it. We, so we have the value here, right? Um, let's do this and let's see what happens. Let's print that thing again. Okay. Cargo run. And it says. No, no warnings or anything. We can use the DBG uh, command. So we can say DBG and then we'll say RGB. And let's try that. Okay. So it is printed out our list. And congratulations, you made you made a tuple. That that's really all there is to access like the values inside of that tuple is we'll use like the dot notation. So if you want to get like the second element, you would say like dot one, and that would give us that output there. Okay. Okay. All right. This makes sense. Cool. Feels feels pretty good. Tuples uh, similar to other languages. Uh, once they have been created, this exists. Like this is just like how oh my it God. has to be. You can't do anything. Oh my anymore. god. Prince. <laughs> I, I thought it should be Corgo instead of Cargo. <laughs> what? No, that works. Hold on. We got to do, do very important work right now. Or does it have to be a string? Just alias Corgo equal string Corgo. Yeah, like Chris has in the chat. (laughs) 
Yes. <laughs> now we can do Corgo run. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm very proud of myself. Um, okay, so we... <laughs> Good idea, Chris. Well done. Um, yeah, so we're we're good. We're good. We we can now do cargo. Um, I'm gonna keep using cargo for anybody who like tunes in later, so that we don't confuse the holy crap out of somebody. But that, <laughs> that does make me smile. So okay, so we've got. Um, so now you originally you had said uh, that we would use the like yes this, and so. Fundamentally, what's the difference here? What's changing when when we make that switch? Yeah, so what I was going to get you to do is actually do the version that has it with um, the type. So remember how we mentioned like everything in Rust has a specific type. So a lot of the time it's inferred, but let's say we wanted to explicitly say what we can and can't have in here. So we say oh. our types in here. So this is like representing the shape. Gotcha. And what values we would like to have inside of here. So in our cases, similar to the rules that we had above, we can only have certain size integers inside of here. Okay. And so if I run this, that does what we expect. But then if I were to make this a negative number, because these are unsigned, it would right. yell at me because yes. we can't have a negative value. That's cool. That's really cool. So that now we've got the ability to, with with relatively low effort, validate input. Exactly. And that's, I think, one of the advantages with a type language is that you're kind of describing already ahead of time for anybody coming in as like, these are the rules that you have to be following uh, in order to make the code operate. And I think that kind of gives you a lot of leverage when you're talking about using libraries and packages because you can already say like, I only accept these types. Whereas mm -hmm. on, like in JavaScript, you kind of have to be like, cool, like this is the language we all agree on for what things we can pass in. Otherwise and, it breaks. And I, yeah, and so I'm just kind of like messing with this a little bit to show that as we change it, so like we can set this to be any any amount of, tuples right like it can be whatever and if we don't follow that format it gets it yells at us so if we add extra stuff and I, it looks like this is that's it's inferred as an integer and that's why it's in the curly braces um so we have to match our whoops whoa 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 comment on down there so we have to match our input to yes. our types yes. but these are completely arbitrary as well, right? I can make this whatever I want. Yes. So like, as long as you describe to whatever types that you want to have, then it's totally fine. Excellent. This is very cool. So I'm, uh, I'm into this. Like this is, this is super exciting. Uh, it feels like all the things that I want from TypeScript, you know, it's like, I, I feel like people talk a lot about how much they love TypeScript. And it's because of stuff like this, you're, you're getting these, these really clear definitions. But what I'm understanding here is that with this, you don't have that, like any type that would just kind of let you opt out of typing altogether. You, you have to make sure that things are type safe to function in Rust. And that's one of the kind of differences between uh, something that is a, by design a type language as opposed to a type to sit on top of a language. Because one, you can opt out for uh, TypeScript. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that in itself kind of, it's not a problem, but it doesn't give you the same kind of strength because it's an easy opt out. It's an escape hatch. Uh, so technically you can be able to say like, cool, I'm just gonna write JavaScript again, uh, even though you're using TypeScript. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, man, this is cool. This is very cool. So, all right, so we've got tuples. And when we're using these, this so this is kind of like the, the long way. And I, I can see this being wonderful as you get started. Uh, but if I wanted to do, like, let's say a, a person, and this person was going to have, like, a name, or sorry. So this person's going to need a name mm -hmm. and an age and That's I don't in know seconds. <laughs> in seconds yes it was 
uh, literally born yesterday. No, just a couple of minutes ago. Um, and that's that's enough. So then in here, <laughs> I would do um, what's a, is a string like str. So in so there's technically two forms of string. Okay. Um, and one of them is someone in chat had already mentioned is called a string view. It's also known as a string slice. Uh, so you use the ampersand in front of the str. Okay. And what would the what does that mean? Uh, so in this case, it's a signifier for like a hard coded string you can kind of think of. Mm -hmm. um, this is a string known ahead of time of like, I know its size. I can like move it and it's fixed in size. Okay. And I do that because we're not going to. So if I was going to change this and like eventually add my last name, then that would break this because it would be a different size, right? Right. You wouldn't use this type. Okay. Uh, and that ampersand, like once again, it, it means something else, which we will get to. Um, okay. There's like a lot of sp small things in Rust that happen. And I, okay. I don't want to throw you into that. Yeah. Part yeah, yeah. No, no worries. <laughs> so I'm, I'm now I've defined my person. Right. And if I run this, it's going to break broke why couldn't i okay let me see if i can figure this out all right so it expected Wait, read that error yeah so that's an important error there i have mismatch types it expected a tuple because of default return type yes okay so so i defined context. a tuple yes and then i gave it what i thought was a tuple oh wait i'm missing a bunch of semicolons one, yes. one moment, please. Yes, exactly. Cool. And now it works. OK. So uh, does it tell me here that I didn't? Oh, I started doing stuff. So you did a bunch of good things. Uh, the thing, the things that you saw in the errors, and this is like one of the errors that tripped me up for a really long time. And you'll see it a bunch of times, depending on what you're doing. Uh, if you go back up to the first error, so still a little bit more. Cool. Oh, there's that oh, there's so yeah. oh oh. It told me up at the top. I didn't go up fine enough, far enough. Uh, so it tell it tells us a few things. It says like add semicolon, which is the one thing we did, and that there was another error that says like expected mm -hmm. parenthesis found this. So the one right below, if we yeah. scroll just a tiny bit. Uh, here, yeah. So this is the one that threw me, and I I didn't yes. realize there was another one above it. Um, and so, okay, so I get it. I understand. So yeah, if I, if I miss it, um, and that's probably a, a fault of me not looking at like the full error output, uh, cause it's, it's fairly obvious when you're like looking at the full output, but I was scrolling up and I just stopped at the first error. And so Nick. this yeah. is very, very helpful. Like, Hey, you should fix that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good. It, like, it, like I said, it, it kind of knows that, uh, the, the, the errors usually are best read from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. um, Chris mentions that in the chat. And that is very true is usually uh, because of it being like compiled is like one of those things where it's like, uh, I can find the error first, and then I'm going to like throw a bunch of more errors if I see them. And it's sometimes hard to know like which one of those do I actually need to be fall falling for. Uh, one of the errors that came up is that the expected parenthesis because of default return type. Mm -hmm. And that error is saying like our main function isn't actually supposed to return anything beyond this empty parenthesis. And so oh. what was happening is that you were returning the debug statement. Oh, uh, and it's basically like, oh, I don't know what to do. And that was also cascaded by returning person. Uh, and that goes to the part of there's, there is somewhat, it's not, I don't want to say this. It's like, it's kind of like an implicit return, but it's not actually true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes a ton of sense. I man, I'm I'm having fun. This is great. So let's take a look here. And so now I've I've put this together where, you know, we've defined we've got we want a string and then we have our our unsigned 8-bit integer for an age and as these expanded like if we had complex objects where you know you had a um, 
a pet and then the pet had some sub things like type of pet or age of pet or dietary restrictions for pet, you know, because we got bougie pets out here. Um, then you have the uh, Prince, that joke was funnier than you acted. <laughs> I wasn't listening. I'm sorry. God, I'm, I'm like wasting my, my best material on you over here. Um, but so, <laughs> so as we get uh, as we as we get into more complex object types, I can see this being complicated because like, am I would I be able to do something like, let's say I wanted a, another tuple in here like a, I want to put an RG. My favorite color is an RGB value. And so I would do like, let's say that my favorite color is just bright red. What happens if I try to do that? It does right. work. Okay. Yep. This is getting hard to read though. Yes. And this is where structs can come in and save the day for us. Okay. One of the, uh, the things about this you know, program right now is that we kind of have this like strict structure with what we're trying to do. We want a name. We want an age. We mm -hmm. want a set of colors. And right now, if we like, were to look at this it doesn't actually look like anything it isn't semantically meaningful and yeah. i think this is that goes to those like ah we should like make it semantic semantically meaningful so let's make a struct and we okay. can do this outside of our main function and uh, this is, is there create... a standard for like above or below i don't I, I guess it's more like convention than it is like you must do's okay um and even then i think everyone follows different things as they do okay um where do you like to put it I usually like to do mine at the top. I like to okay. put things easier to read at the top. Um, and that's not it. It's not a no, keyword. That, 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 it is no. a keyword? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm ready. We just got to give it a name. So like, what would you want to name this track? It's called this a person. Perfect. Works beautifully already. Um, and so the struct, we give it the name that we want and then you already kind of knew to make it like a capital version of that thing. Cause, and that's like, I think just out of nature of everything that we write. And mm -hmm. then we put our curly braces and then we have to describe what are the fields inside of that struct. So, yep. And you're already, you're already getting in the swing of it. Is this, is it like this? Like very close. Uh, you want them actually to be semicolon. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, what is the word? Commas. Commas. Okay. And then uh, color would be okay. Um, and then does the last one also have a comma, or is it, do I terminate it? I think it's actually fine to have both. Okay, it's like this without the semicolon. Without the semicolon. The okay. Mm -hmm. And then what we can do is we can make a new struct. So let's go uh, go back down and let's try to take all of those values and put them inside of our struct. So we'll say the struct instance itself. So we'll say person and then not with parentheses, we'll actually use the curly brackets, which this is the part where it gets a little, little bit more confusing. And we need to uh, connect them to the name, similar to like an object inside of JavaScript. Oh, I get it. Okay, so I can do like name, age, color, right? Yep. And then would I do like mm -hmm. this? Yep. And then you want the semicolon at the end of this one. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. So we're going to pull this up here so we can see it. And then I'm going to run this. Uh, and oh, I no. don't think we, it will work because we have a few lifetime bugs. parameter mm. lifetime because i need the lifetime so bear bear with me mm. chris says use string yes okay so we're just gonna there's like yeah there's like this is where things get a little wonky i'm gonna show you both things like this or, so we'll wait. keep the uh, we'll keep this and we'll put a a static in front of it. This is a lifetime, and we won't talk about that. I will not be able to explain those to you in thirty more minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, but the kind of synopsis is that we basically have to describe how long a specific thing has to stay uh, available for us. 
And okay. this is just kind of doing that for us. In okay. The, in the, like the shortest version, it's not the most accurate, but it, like in this, the synopsis of it is that's what it's doing here. Now it doesn't like, cannot be formatted using this, uh, this thing. Yes. And this is where sometimes it's easier to use the, the pretty print version of it. And that's when so you do this. And it kind of told us there before. Do I, I do this? Do that. I'll send it back. Yeah, let's try it. Should work. Cannot be okay. formatted using this one. So if I leave that out. And, but didn't that not work before? No. How are you going to give us recommendations to do something and it's not going to do that thing? <laughs> Doesn't implement standard format display. Yes. And so this is one of those you things. You may be able to use. Oh, what about this one? I see that one. I don't even know what that is. Yeah. So what we're going to do though, instead, it's going to be easier this way. Um, yeah, like so let's that. go back to the top and I'm going to do this one for you. Okay. We're going to derive debug and let's do that question mark version again. Okay. Um, before I run this, do you want to tell me what this does? Yes. So this particular thing is is like an one is an attribute. Uh, it creates uh, something for us. It does, and you can kind of think of it as similar to like meta programming, mm -hmm. and it generates code for you. Okay. It, it's going to do a bunch of stuff for you. And some languages are called the mac macros, um, but this one is called an attribute. Um, and this and one is saying it's applying it to the struct. Yes. Got it. And is, is that what's uh, like the, this would kind of be like, as a JavaScript parallel, when you have like a um, like the classes where you would like do the at thing and like attach something to the to the class, I think those are called decorators. Decorators. Um, Is this a decorator? I, I don't. I I get kind of nervous calling them things like they are in other places. They're like I, a decorator. They're kind of it, but they like do so much. They just like do a lot. And that's why it's like a loaded term is yeah, like, yes, yeah. the answer. But I, I think of them like that is if I like put them like together and like Chris says, it's like a Babel plugin built into the language. Okay. Like, Cause you can do a lot more with them than just like do what de decorators allow you to do. Got it. Oh yeah. And so here then it, it debugs very, very nicely. Um, and does that mean then if I were to switch this back out to debug because we we derived it from debug, then it should theoretically do what we want? It does. Let's see, Look at that. Perfection. That is very nice. Awesome. And you'll see it gives us the name of that thing. It also gives us all of the keys attached to those. And values. this this is meaningful. Like this is actually useful as opposed to having to just remember that we defined a person in these these very loose terms of like, that's what a person looks like. And you know, that, that would, that wouldn't help us. This exactly. is helpful. Yeah. Okay. And like they give us more structure and that's, you know, what they come, come with that name for. Yeah. 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 Ooh, this is cool. I like this a lot. Um, all right. So let's maybe, can I nest these? Like what if I, okay. So let me try, let me try one on my own and then you can tell me if this is way out of, way out of out of dodge here so i'm going to derive debug and then i'm going to set what up is a that called? struct what was it called it was called a uh, deriver <laughs> no that's good no it's a, an attribute that's totally an attribute. fine <laughs> <laughs> uh and then i'm going to define rgb not ruth yeah. bader ginsburg um <laughs> and then we're going to set this to have a red oh wait if I want it to be just like a straight, can I do a struct that's like, let me, let me say what I'm, what I'm trying to do. And then you can tell me if this is a thing that actually makes sense. I want this to be like a type like that so that we could, we could reuse this later if I wanted to like define a color outside. So if I still want it to be just a, a tuple like this. Do I, do I have to give it a name or can I make it like top level like this? So you, you would want to give it a name. 
Okay. Um, but let maybe one of the ways that we could do this, and this kind of could be an, a, a fun experiment for us. This is something I, I didn't anticipate, but let's maybe change instead of it calling it RGB, let's make the struct called color. And then the, the name is RGB. So like inside of the field that is RGB, um, which begs the question of like, how do we all do these things? And perfect. And let's try making a color, storing that into a variable, and then passing that into our person, and then making it all happen. Expected it's not going to work now. Color. It, everything's still broken, but you you see the error here. I do see the I do see the error, which means then I need to do like a color. Okay, that got us there. Um, so this is, this is fine, but it's nested. I mean, that's okay. We can, we can leave it there. So but, we can do other things as well. Okay. Um, so one of the things that kind of like was suggested as well is a, what is known as a tuple struct. So okay. like, um, it's not like the syntax you had before, but it is still very valid. I, I just want to throw you through all the loops because that's me, I'm a teacher at heart. Um, so instead of having the field name like mm -hmm. RGB, we can be like struct color and then just pass, just give the tuple as is. So, so no, if we don't want no curlies. Me, yes. Okay. Like that. Yes. And then down here. And I think we will want a semicolon in front of that one. And sorry, the struct above, yes. Okay. Let's try that out this time. And then do I need to define it as a color or can I just throw it in? I'm going to try it. Watch it explode. To... <laughs> you probably still need to give it the, the color. Expected name. struct color got a tuple. So if I send in a color. Neat. All right. I'm into it. I like it. Perfect. This is, yeah, this, okay. This, this is, this is all starting to click for me. This makes sense. Um, all right. So we can do these, these kind of like strict definitions where if we've got a color that we know is a list of three eight bit integers, then we can, you know, set that here. And then I could also use that out here as like a color, right? Theoretically, no. Expected struct color found a tuple. Oh, so I'd have to. Mm -hmm. And so this is like where you have to like um, really pay attention to like all of the types and all the things. And the question was asked is like struct like a class. Um, in a sense, yes. A struct is similar to a class. It can do things like uh, tell you kind of like the type, give you kind of structure to that thing. Uh, it doesn't do classes specifically, but this is kind of the the touch point to where like object oriented programming comes to Rust. Rust kind of does both object oriented ish, because Rust can those structs can also have methods on them, and then um, what you call it? I lost my train of thought. Oh, functional. There we go. And it also has functional uh, capabilities. So uh, methods like map, filter, those also exist. Ooh, okay. So yeah, can we can we write some functions or did, did you have something else that you wanted to go through before that? Hmm. We got about 20 minutes left, just just time checking. Let's try to make a method for our person struct. Okay. So making a method for a struct actually means that we're going to do some implementations. So we're not going to uh, write anything inside of the struct. Okay. But what we're going to do is we're going to write in a new block uh, and outside. Yeah. We're going to say impl, I-M-P-L. That stands for you know implementation. We're going to implement some functionality for a thing. And so we have to describe mm. uh, that thing that we're implementing for, and we'll say the person. Like that. And so, mm -hmm, exactly. And then we'll okay. have our 
curly braces afterwards. And here we'll be able to like describe any functions that we want to have for our person. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to, yeah. So we can do something like this. Yes. And we still have to describe it as a function. So we'll still use the FN keyword in front. Okay. And then we, well, let's go without any of that. Uh, then we could probably have it like, all right, I'm going to, let's see. <laughs> That's not going to work, is it? No. Okay. I'll tell you how to make it work though. Let's do it this, this way. So we're trying to make it a method that is related to our person. So mm -hmm. we actually need to tell our method here, you have the value of that person. So as an argument to say hello, we're gonna use ampersand self. And that ampersand, that that thing, once again, it's it's talking about like a sense of ownership. We're not owning self, we're just taking advantage, like we're borrowing the value that self is. So that's why we wanna have that there. Okay. And so now we can use it just like as the name itself. And so we can say self dot name. Okay. Let's try it out. And then if I want to try it out, I would say person dot say hello. And assuming, nope, doesn't like that because value borrowed here after move, copy trait. Maybe it's just because I debugged it. That's a great question. It shouldn't have happened like that. That's okay, so it doesn't like some stuff. I think maybe because we use debug as the derivy thingy. Yes, and I don't know why the debug did that. Should have maybe a maybe snake case name. Else. You have a snake case name. Yes, everything inside of Rust is preferably snake cased. And so this goes back to one of the biggest concepts inside of Rust, which I, I didn't think we would get to, um, but the concept of borrowing. So this is like very different than uh, something like C. The, mm -hmm. the values can only have a single owner at a time or variables or like things that exist can only have a, a single owner. And that means like I can, once I take ownership of a thing, it, whoever else had ownership, does not have that thing anymore. We cannot have two owners at the same time. And this is okay. the reasons why you'll see those, those ampersands is that we're not saying we have ownership. We're actually saying we're borrowing a value. So when I have that self there, I'm not taking ownership of self, but I'm rather using the value, at, taking, you know, just a nice little hand, hand holding. And can I have this for a little bit? And okay. then you give it back to whoever is the owner. Got it. And, but when we, when we do this, Apparently debug is not borrowing. It's it's like give me that it's mine. When we run the in debug this, command. In this case, we are talking about a type. So it's like a generic type. Whereas this and like what we are talking about is an actual value with the self. And what somebody had mentioned in the chat is like we're moving person into debug. Um, and this isn't always the case because you could do the same. I think you could do the same thing with print line. It would be fine, but I don't know why debug does it. And it specifically must be that it's moving it into this particular macro. So mm. if we use the print line function, let's try and see if that causes an error instead. Does not implement the copy trait. Okay. So we gotta, we would have to change some stuff, but if I use print line, then it just works. Yeah. Okay, so debug does some some business and yes. we would need to, to argue with it a little bit to get it to share. So debug, yes. what we're learning is that uh, print line is friendly and knows in like attended preschool and debug is like the, the that like mean only child is like, <laughs> give me that, it's mine. Exactly. Um, and I think that's like important to know about Russ and sometimes you'll see those errors is like, as you're playing around with functions, as you're playing around with a bunch of different uh, places that you want to put code, mm -hmm. uh, the compiler is going to warn you when it notices that you're doing something that it's not allowed to do. It, Rust is really intelligent in the sense that like, it can know ahead of time, it like checks all the rules for all the pieces of code to check mm -hmm. if that works. Yeah, 
Okay. And and so like if I want to can you just stack stuff like I can just be like also do this or does that yeah, you should be able to do this. Know. I don't Let's know see if what you happens. Would typically, try to do that. Uh, I would do what I want. <laughs> we're gonna, we're, all right, cool, 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 cool. All right, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna are you gonna cooperate? Let's find out. No, you're not gonna cooperate. Yeah. Doesn't implement copy. <laughs> Touching my stuff. Yes, and this is an an important uh, part about it is the copy. Uh the things that we're doing, the derives, sometimes need to be able to implement certain features that like, okay. describe, like, how am I supposed to do that thing? Um, so, like, debug, for instance, like, it kind of, it, it doesn't need everything. It just knows, like, oh, okay, cool. Like, take what you need to. But copy requires a little bit additional work. Mm, okay, okay, I get it. Well, cool. So, this is, I mean, uh, like, I, I definitely feel like we're, you know, we're barely scratching the surface here. So, what if, what if we... Um, if we wanted to do something like instead of saying hello, what if I wanted to return a value and then like use that value somewhere else? Value. So like instead of having the the function print, like could I store the output of this function in a variable out here? Like, you know, something like let um, we'll do it the rust way, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and like have say hello return a string instead of just printing immediately is that a thing and uh, am i confusing myself <laughs> no no you're totally fine so what that would mean is that we need to uh return back that string right uh -huh. we needed to be able to do this and this is probably where we would want to do the actual like return of a value um but right now we're not doing that right and so let us change this to format. Someone actually mentions this in the chat. So you can use the format. I think that should be fine. Is it like format. FMT or like format? The full name like this. Okay. And does it still this, have an exclamation point? It does. Okay. And then we actually have to specifically return something. So that means, uh, uh, let's say, yeah, put return. And then we're going to need to tell the function that it's going to return something. Before we didn't tell it to return anything, it's just going to do what it's doing. Uh, but this time we're going to actually return like a string. Uh, so close. Oh, so close. You, oh, I wanted to believe. This is <laughs> um, the things that we want to do. And I know that we can, there's like certain ways that we can also enhance this, but I want to walk through all the ways first. Uh, so chat knows like, hey, we're going to do this the long way first. Uh, but we're going to do string this time. Instead. Okay. Okay. All right. And and this is because um, if we did it this way, it would be expecting like a, a set length of value. And that is not the case. Or or because that, that wouldn't give up ownership. It would be borrowing. Wait. I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> This is goes back to the, there's two different types of strings in here. Uh, there's some like known things and there's some unknown things. And so we're just going to accept that this is the, this is the one that knows like, Hey, I'm dynamic. I'm, I can change in size as much as I want to. Whereas the other one's like, cool. I want to stay at this specific size. And that's kind of the difference. Got it. Okay, great. Um, and then is the semicolon in a return statement? Do we leave that in or take it out or? Let's start with this one and let's see what happens. Okay, okay. I'm gonna try things. Okay. It did, it did the thing, I think. Perfect. Right? It I says, hi, I my name is right? Jason. Yes, yeah, I did. You okay. did, you did. <laughs> oh, awesome. So now what someone else had suggested uh, is to remove the semicolon. We can actually also remove the return in front. And this and, is an implicit return. Okay. And so this, I imagine, is one of those things that the first time you see it, you're like, this is terrible. And then it's the only thing you'll ever use once it clicks in your brain. Basically, there also are some edge cases where you don't want to do this, where it's like easier to be more explicit than it is uh, implicit. Um, I think Chris actually wrote a blog post around this where it's like, I thought I could do this and I cannot. And it's specifically around like uh, if conditions mm. uh, and because there's like a, a weird syntax when you read it, you try doing everything like this, but then it actually turns out it bites you in the butt when you do it. 
So that's why uh, I suggested starting with this one first. Oh, I have another idea then. Um, can I just add another function down here? Try, yeah. Okay. You should be able to do it like just like that. Uh, let's see. And then I would get my object. And this Ooh, is going to return okay. a string. All right. right. And then now what I want to do is I want to say if I'm just going to start writing code and you're going to tell me that it's wrong. <laughs> um, say if age is less than 21, because this is a, a US based program, then we would want to return. I'm going to try some silly things and see if they work. I think this is the best part about programming. And this is like why I let you like go on because I, I want you to to experiment and like feel what it's like because that's the only way you get to well, really I mean, learn a language, right? Is like, you're not just like following the steps from a book, but you're also like experimenting with what you are learning. Okay, so let me walk through where my my reasoning is on this. This, without a semicolon, is an implicit return. So, what I'm thinking, I don't know if comparisons work in Rust, so we're going to find out. But if the age is under 21, then I'm implicitly returning this string. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I'm implicitly returning this string. So, what I expect to happen is that if I... If I do something like this, beverage, what should happen then is that I will do something like this, and then we'll just print out another line here. And I think it's going to explode. It did. But let's it is going to explode. Why. Let's see if we can read the errors. There's so many errors. I did so many <laughs> things wrong. Um, oh, okay. So the first one is an obvious one. I just typoed. So I should have done self.age instead of age. So right. let's fix that, run it again. And I like your like process of like, just do one thing and then break. Yes, that's my, my favorite way to, to be wrong in programming is like one step at a time. Because I remember when I, was, when I was earlier in my career, if something went wrong, I would go and change a bunch of things thinking that I was solving the problem. And it, then I wouldn't know if, if I had like, fix one problem and created a new one or if I had actually changed something. So I now I'm like one line. Did it break differently or the same? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, definitely. And OK, one thing that Chris mentioned just as well, and I think I have never thought about it like this, uh, but I actually really love it is like the framing around how we treat them really shapes our like how we engage with them. So like, for instance, Chris calls them help texts instead of errors. And I think that's hmm. actually a really mindful way of like making sure you're like taking the time to like understand it because it's not trying to work against you it's in fact trying to tell you like hey do the thing okay so now i have issues yes. where i have mismatched types right. it expected a string and what did and it say? i apparently sent a variable or a fixed length string mm -hmm. try using a conversion method okay that's helpful Oh, that's so cool. I didn't even realize you were doing both of them at the same time. <laughs> hey, it worked. Okay, now let's check if my logic works by changing my age. Also important thing to test. <laughs> Hello, Hassan. We are talking about hey! Rust. Hey! What if it's right on the line? What if I'm what if I am 21? Okay. 20. Look at that. It is doing exactly what we expected. Um, and I will say this is, if that's not an endorsement of Rust, I don't know what is because I have literally no idea how to write Rust. And I was just able to reason my way through based on the different, like the help text, the error messages, all the things that were happening that all coached me through um, refactoring that my best guess code, which is, that's pretty awesome. That's really, really nice that that, that it does that for you. Yeah. And you've learned like a ton of things. Like uh, for the most part, you've like t took everything that I've learned from reading the Rust programming language book 
and like put it together. There's a few more concepts that come along the way. Um, things that we don't have the time to talk about. Yeah, but we are, we are like out of time, unfortunately. Enums. Uh, mm. We'll talk about match operators. Um, those are kind of similar to, um, what do they call them? Uh, like switch statements? But like fancy switch statements? What are they called? Pattern matching? Is that what you're That's thinking That's the of? one. Yeah. Pattern matching is fancy switch statements, Prince. Yes. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's it's like a switch with a monocle. Um okay, yeah. So this is uh this is super exciting. For those of us who want to take this further, uh myself, I'm I'm now very excited about seeing what else we can build with this. I'm gonna try to come up with excuses to to build something real. <laughs> um where should we go? Like what should what what should we do next? I think the the thing that I want to to kind of leave you with is to figure out like how do you learn more things. One of the th ways that you can go learn more is let's go to your terminal real quick, um, and we're gonna type a command in there. Is say Rust up, and then space doc, and then space with the flag book. So two hyphens and then book. Beautiful. Oh, and this is local. Yes, and that's what I wanted to make sure to show. So Rust, out of the box, comes up with a bunch of different materials for learning. A bunch of it is the Rust programming language book, as well as uh, exercises like known as Rustlings. They're all hosted online as well. Um, but if you go to Rust up doc and you tr do that, once you've installed Rust, you can find all of the different materials that are locally available for you. Oh, Basically and this, everything is live as well. Yeah, this opened in the wrong thingy, but it's over here. Yeah, this is really exciting. So here's the edition guide, the Rust C book, the cargo book, the Rust doc book, um, reference Rustonomicon. Good naming. You know, I'm I'm a fan of. Uh, oh, and and then also we have to show. Let's pull over here the the rust bot um we'll just do it right in general <laughs> it makes me so happy um but so this yeah this is a a super fun thing that we can do um and and this is you built this right the the rust bot yeah so Chris, Derek, myself, as well as Will, uh, we have all been working on a Discord bot. Where would uh, I find this? Yeah, it's at github.com slash partycorgi slash corgo, C-O-R-G-O hyphen bot. Okay. And here's a Rust bot in here. Yeah, so, so there's two implementations. One is in JavaScript, one is in Rust. We've primarily been spending a lot of our time in Rust. And so right now they're separate set of commands. And this is using a lot of the same things that we talked about today, uh, things that we also didn't get into, such as um, well, there's a whole all sorts bunch of, of fun stuff in here. A ton yeah. of things in here you haven't seen yet. So a lot of it you can read, you know, like structs, you know, like variables, you know, a lot of the things in here. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's at least good. Yeah. 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 So this will be a fun thing. If, if anybody wants to go uh, get involved, you can go drop in here you also have um, the Discord that you can come join with us if you want to learn more. Uh, if you just want to hang out with a bunch of bunch of people with a whole lot of different interests and and uh, people who just like to learn and share and do stuff, you know, play games, learn things, all that fun stuff. Come hang out with us in the Party Corgi Discord. That is at um, partycorgi.com. If you want to get more details, hope we see you in there. Um, Prince, where should people go if they want to learn more about you outside of your Twitter? Outside of my Twitter really is not much beyond my website at prince.dev. Um, that's really the only other place that I live on the internet. And you've got and I, all sorts of stuff going on on Rust as well. Like you're, you're taking notes. Mm -hmm. um, you've been doing um, the... Good point. I do live streams now uh, every Tuesday at 6.30 EST. Uh, or GMT, what is it now? GMT. Are you Max Max L W on Twitch? Is that right? Yes, Max L W on Twitch. Go go go! Follow for more Rust streams. 
And I think that is all the time we have today. So one more shout out to uh, White Coat Captioning. Amanda, thank you for the uh, the captioning today. That's made possible by Netlify, Fauna, Sanity, and Auth0. Um, make sure you go and check our schedule because we've got so much fun stuff coming up. Um, we had prints today. Uh, next week, we've got Kelly Vaughn. We're going to do some Shopify stuff. That's going to be a blast. Then um, Emma Bostian's coming on, and we're going to mercilessly ridicule her about liking Taco Bell. That's going to be <laughs> a really, really fun episode. We're, we're going to be building some fun stuff. We've got a, we've got a whole thing. It's going to be, I, I hope it's going to be funny. Um, <laughs> so please tune in for that one. And then Ben Elegbodu is going to come on and teach us about React and TypeScript. That's going to be a whole lot of fun, um, especially because if you haven't seen Ben, he is a fantastically like engaging and funny speaker and teacher. Um, Eve, an, uh, Eve is like one of my favorite people in the world, is going to teach us about GraphQL. Uh, we've got Shelby Spees coming on to teach us about observability and um, like just, it, yeah, the, this, I'm so excited for this one. This one's going to be very similar to what we did today, Prince, where I have no idea what I'm going into. I'm just going to be asking all the beginner questions, but it's just it's okay. good stuff all the way down. Please come hang out with us. Um, Prince, any last words before we before we wrap up? I think my last set of words for you all is explore something that makes you excited. Explore something that's unknown to you. Uh, take it with the beginner mindset as you do because it's super important. Otherwise, you're going to not let yourself explore and be like excited for all the things you can find. Excellent. All right, with that, that's all we got today. Chat, thank you for hanging out. Stay tuned. We're going to go raid Chris on Code. Prince, thank you for hanging out with us. We Thanks will see you next time. Bye, y'all.